welcome to the Boardwalk Talks series brought to you by the Aquarium at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I'm one of the educators at the lab and we are out at Gilliard Island um, with Dr. John Dindo. Good morning. And uh, John is going to tell us a little bit about the island and we're going to talk about the role of Mo the Mobile Bay Estuary and about the island's role as a rookery for brown pelicans in particular and some other bird species. So with that, I'll let John tell you about it. So we're on a man-made island, uh, first constructed in 1982 to be a, a basin for the Theodore Industrial Canal. Uh, during the 70s and 80s, the, there were no brown pelicans anywhere around, mainly due to DDT. Um, but in 84, the first pair of brown pelicans nested, and from that time to today, this colony has grown to the point where there are 5,000 pairs of brown pelicans that nest here. This is the largest single colony nesting in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, they're very successful here, mainly because the island is is off limits to the to, to the public. It's very dangerous to get here because of all the rock development that's all around the island. And there are no natural predators out here. Once in a while, the uh, the fire ants may may take a chick, but uh, there hasn't been any raccoons out here at all. So so they're they're pretty well successful out here. That that number of 5,000 pairs has been steady now for the last six or seven years. So the colony is pretty stable. So um, can you tell a little bit about the um, the history of the the DDT, the role of DDT? Sure. In sure. So the company that most people may remember the name Monsanto, it's been sold now, but they they developed an insecticide that was very very effective. Uh, in agriculture in the in the 70s. Um, what they didn't realize was the half-life of DDT was long and as it came off the agricultural fields and entered the aquifers and traveled down streams it affected the species of predator birds and it didn't kill the adults. It interfered with the eggshell gland and that basically prohibited the females from calcifying the shell. So for years and years and years they didn't have they weren't able to actually produce uh, an egg shell and the populations just disappeared. Ospreys, bald eagles, and brown pelicans. So this was because uh, I, when this pesticide was applied to crops it would then be flushed into streams when it rained and it would the small worms and insects on the uh, that were feeding from the bottom it would get into their um, food chain and then and, and then right go up and so it was the fish eating birds right that were affected they were by affected by it and so um, in the early 80s this was an endangered species absolutely um, like like I said there's people that live here all their lives in the 70s if they saw a brown pelican in the summer they called all their neighbors up hey we just saw one brown pelican fly by now it's an everyday occurrence people just don't realize how lucky we are to, to have this kind of habitat and the, the, one of the reasons that we have this colony and we have this is because of the habitat. Mobile Bay is the fourth largest drainage basin by volume in North America. It produces, it produces a plethora of food resources for the life that exists in and around Mobile Bay. In and around. Fish species, crustaceans, bivalves. So this colony is so solely based as, as fish eaters and so the bay provides a resource for these birds to nurture their young. Now we'll see later on what the eggs look like and what a standard what a standard uh, typical number of eggs and we're talking about brown pelicans there are also 15,000 laughing gulls that nest here there are three to four thousand uh, terns there are a couple thousand egrets all of these species that nest here are feeding from Mobile Bay, Mississippi Sound, and, and the Eastern Shore. So Mobile Bay is it, it's a critical habitat for, for this kind of life. 
So we showed the, the Mobile Bay watershed. Um, Angela um, showed this image. A watershed is an area of land that drains to a particular body of water. So all of that in green drains to Mobile Bay. It covers most of Alabama, part of Mississippi, part of Georgia, and even a little a bit little of A little bit of Tennessee. And so there are a lot of um, uh, nutrients that flow into the bay along with the river water. Um, and then, John, can you talk a little bit about discovering the first uh, pelicans nesting here? <laughs> well, it was uh, Dr. Ken Marion from UAB and I were out here um, just looking around, sampling, seeing what's going on. Actually, we were looking for uh, snakes and turtles because he's a turtle guy. And we found these we found these couple nests out here, and we found a lot of laughing gull nests. And we also found a bulldozers working. And all of a sudden, a big, huge flock of laughing gulls got up in the air, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. We got over to that site, and here's a bulldozer unaware of what was the operator unaware of what was going on driving right through a colony of laughing gulls and right next to that was the brown pelicans so you know that was quickly ended and uh, a, a nice compromise was raised with the Corps of engineers in which in which they they don't dredge during nesting season and what's what's really interesting about these birds is they're called colonial nesters. Herons and egrets are colonial nesters. Brown pelicans are colonial nesters. What you're seeing right now is just the beginning of a colony. There's about 500 birds on nest right here, right now. And what happens is the, the older adults select a site. The site can be anywhere on, on this island and they sit down and they start to nest. As the other birds start to arrive for nesting, they nest right next to where those older adults were. And the colony expands from the center outward. And then, in this case here, it will, it will move to the uh, east and to the south, and eventually up over the berm and into the vegetation behind us. So they're, they're packed in like this because of that innate behavior of colonial nesting. When you say the older birds, there's no, do you know about the age yeah, of the older ones that start? Yeah, there's there's no real distinction. There's no way of aging these birds while they were alive. So no, we don't. We know that they're they're probably at, at least a two year old or a three year old to start to start their nesting cycle, um, and then beyond beyond that we don't. You know, we just there's just no way of knowing. Um, and they they share nest responsibilities. The uh, one right there that is sitting on the nest and adding nest material. You might. So this is a the, this frontal area where we're standing below us. These birds just started building nests here. We're going to travel down to the uh, first part of the berm where they first started to nest, and you'll see how farther along they are in advancement. There's more. There's eggs in the nest. Three, sometimes two to three eggs in each of the nests. So, do we want to start taking that walk? Sure. Actually, let's. Before we take that walk, if we, I am zoomed in somewhere where they're right here, where you can see. What do you see? I see a pelican with two eggs underneath. Okay. Yes, right. And and uh, these birds maintain temperature of the eggs by their feet. They'll eventually get in the nest and shuffle their feet so their eggs are sitting on top of their feet. And those those feet are the temperature regulator for the egg. If it's cold at night, because of the blood flow, it adds heat to the egg. And during the day when it's really hot, that blood flow removes heat from around the nest. So that, that keeps the temperature correct for the, for the uh, eggs. So, John, we're talking about, um, you know, this as a, um, as a pelican colony, and we're talking about the recovery of the pelicans and the role of um, Mobile Bay, the Mobile Bay estuary in this recovery. Um, and the, the fish that these birds eat out of the, the bay. Um, so I thought, you know, this is the 50th anniversary of the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. So I thought we could also kind of talk a little bit about the history of your research out here. I know sure. you mentioned the discovery of the 
pelicans, but also um, just kind of yeah, a little bit about the research I think, that you've done. Yeah, years. I think Mendel's referring to the fact that I'm old. <laughs> Today's <laughs> birthday, too. Happy birthday, John. Um, yeah, it's, the, lab, the lab's had a tremendous history and relationship to our habitat here. Uh, scientists come here to study the bay, to study the nearshore waters, to study the marsh. And what's, what makes it so exciting is the diversity that you find here and actually the health of the habitat. Now, that's not to say that our system doesn't have pollution problems. Of course we have pollution problems. But with that being said, we still have a large, diverse habitat of both plants and animals that, that inhabit this area. Thus, it becomes a, a wonderful place for scientists to come and, and study. In the 40 plus years that I've been here, I've worked in a number of different habitats from, from offshore to, to inshore, um, from working with sharks and fish to working with birds. And it's just, it's just a great place to, to set up and do your, re, to do your research. We're going to... We're gonna walk. Start, take the walk. Yeah, let's let's yeah. take a walk down this the, down this berm. Um, we're up we're up on the high the high point of the berm, and um, as we move, we'll be, we'll be moving down down the berm again. As I said, this is a active Corps of Engineer island, and um, they they have a dredge plan, and they they tend to keep their dredging uh, during the off season of nesting. We work with them closely so that uh, they're not actually dredging when the birds are on nests. When the birds are not on the nests, they're not hanging out on this island that much. Yeah, they do. They hang around on the edge. Um, not, they're more mobile. They're but they're more, yeah, they're far, they're far more mobile. And, you know, in, as the cold temperatures approach, the food resources are harder to find and so they move towards uh, other shorelines where food resources are more readily available. When does nesting season begin, John? Uh, actually, we, it just started about two weeks ago and it will run all the way through um, July. Just imagine the temperatures out here in July. And thus, thus the reason for these birds maintaining that egg temperature because the air temperature is so hot. When are the fledgling flight capable? Um, within, they'll, they'll get flight feathers probably within uh, four months. Uh, they still stay around the nest um, expecting to be fed and the adults do a good job of bringing prey items back to the nest all during that time frame. So we're, we're going to approach part of the nesting area that was established maybe about three weeks ago. And um, you'll see that we have, here's a, a nest made in a, in a tire. And um, Two eggs. The eggs are normally the egg clutch size is around three. They have, um, because of the lack of predation, they have uh, high success rates in the 90% hatching success rate. Um, is it variable depending on, like, the, you mentioned that the older pelicans nest first, so that seem to suggest that they have prime nesting locations? No. Nope. Nope, they, uh, it, it, it all depends. Their choice of nesting sites is, we're not sure why. Each, this is the first year that they chose this site to start. Um, they, they, in other times, they've chosen off the other side of the berm. There's a large field of cactus uh, just to the east of us. They chose that as the first nesting site. But you can, as you look around here, you can see that, um, this was established about two weeks ago. Two, two, so these, these eggs are around two, two and a half weeks old. Some with two and some with three. Um, and we have, here's a, here's, here's a couple different stages of the, of the birds you can see. So here's two eggs 
and here's a chick that has that has hatched and one that's pipping out there's an egg tooth there and he's just pipping out there and the as chick is alive right yes that it looks like a little baby dinosaur no feathers whatsoever again uh, that's where the adult bird and the feet of the adult bird is very important for temperature regulation then as they get older they get this thing called a uh, gular flutter where they're able to cool panting like a dog so these are different age age classes of these birds they're losing their here are these are in their downy feathers but their flight feathers are just now starting starting to develop you can see the black here and the downy feathers sitting on top and basically this is a main the mainstay of their resource um, Gulf Menhaden come into Mobile Bay and they're maybe one to two inches long this time of year which is perfect uh, food source for the young chicks that can't really hold their neck up but as they get older as the chicks get older the Menhaden grow fast, fastest fish in the estuary and so as far as growth and the adults will come back and regurgitate that into the nest and the chicks will just sit there and pick pick out that food resource so that's a very important aspect of of maintaining these colonies bird colonies colonial bird colonies be it brown pelicans egrets um, tend to be the watchdog of the environment and by that I mean if there's going to be a problem if there's an environmental issue the first place it's going to be reflected is going to be reflected in the production of eggs and chicks on a place like this so it's important to keep a long-term database on what's going on here to to help us study the health and of the ecosystem that we have here so you mentioned that that 5,000 breeding pairs has remained um, stable for the last few years. Yep. And you think that's a reflection of them having reached a carrying capacity yeah. here. So basically what, what Mendel's talking about is the island's huge. We've got plenty of space. To, we could house 50,000 pelicans here uh, on this island because it is it, it is pretty massive the short leg of the island is a mile the other two legs are two miles long there's plenty of habitat for them to nest so what is the limiting factor in maintaining this colony at the size that it is and we believe that it's called the carrying capacity of the bay the bay produces X amount of food resources for these birds again remember it's not just the brown pelicans that are nesting here there's laughing gulls turns um, uh, ibis so all of them feed from this area so there's only so much production that can be carried back to this to this island and and that we believe is what's limiting and keeping that population where it is right now we do expect that sometime in the near future that this colony will fragment we think to the south maybe uh, not on Dolphin Island but to one of the other barrier islands down there and because it's a they can access another uh, area for food resources that did happen about three years ago I had a graduate student working on that but that only lasted one year and then that and then that colony broke up we have a question um does a bird that fledges in April or May have a better chance of survival than one that fledges in late June or July? That's a that's an excellent excellent question. Um, we we haven't really put any trackers on the young fledglings uh, to find out if their success rate uh, once they leave the nest what their success rate is. Um, I. I don't I would say that uh, food resources are abundant for them up up through July I don't think the food's going to be the the, uh, the problem there so I'm, I'm not sure that's a that's a really good question so the you mentioned that there's a really good um, hatching rate you said I think 95 percent hatching, hatching rate yep. success rate what about the and and I know you just said you don't you don't have um, you don't know the difference between the early nests and right. the later nests, but what about the Just, survival rate? Uh, and when we talk about survival rate, I think a lot of people, um, you know, may not understand what survival rate means. So when we say that, we mean that they survive long enough to reach reproductive age. 
Yeah, in this case, in this case here, I mean, uh, reproductive age in these birds would be about two years. So, to know, you would have to band thousands of these young chicks and follow them through a two-year cycle to see really what the percent of survival. So, as as a scientist studying these birds, we we study the birds up until the point of time that they are flight capable, where they can leave the nest and go and feed on their own. So we count a successful nest. If there's two eggs and they hatch and two birds leave that nest, that's a that's a hundred percent success on that nest on that bird. Now, that doesn't mean that bird's going to survive. He may not find enough resources to survive through the whole year. It may be uh, wiped out by a hurricane. We don't know. So our methodology is just looking at what's leaving the nest. Do you know where, it, if the nest, the, the population of the breeding pairs is remaining stable, where are all these chicks going? That's, a, that's, that's another, that's a, that's a really good question. Now, every, you have to imagine that in any population, as a population grows, the mortality rate does increase. Now, in, as our winters, we all, every winter we get phone calls about, oh, there's three dead pelicans here on, on this end of the island, or there's four dead over here. There's a, I mean, starvation does happen, you know, cold months, lack of, lack of uh, food resources. So we lose some of them that way. Obviously, there's a movement. Some of these birds moved in towards Louisiana. What I find very interesting is, Although this colony is here, and I said there was, there's not another colony in Alabama, this is the bird colony for pelicans, there are no breeding colonies of brown pelicans in Mississippi. And yet in Louisiana, they may have 100, 150 different colonies nesting, but they're smaller. There might be one or 200 birds in this colony, uh, one or 200 in another colony. Again, this is the largest single colony in, in the Gulf. Do you have so, a sense that some of these birds may, may be, some of the birds that hatched here may be nesting in Louisiana? Yeah, and we did, we did some GPS tracking about four or five years ago. We put GPS trackers on some of the adults, and we followed them um, around for the feeding part. Most of them stayed in Mobile Bay to feed. One of them wandered all the way to the Chandelure Islands and back. Uh, a couple times, a couple times a month, um, one of the students from um, South Carolina put a tracker on them, and and a band and her bird turned up in Mexico about uh, three months later. So yeah, there's there's movement of these birds throughout throughout the Gulf. We do have somebody who made a comment: brown pelicans do not migrate with a question mark. Well, they don't do. They don't do long distance migration like hummingbirds um, um, or, or big uh, arctic terns and stuff, but they do migrate. Migrate meaning just their net movement from one, from one location to another. It's nothing for these birds to fly to Mississippi, Louisiana. So I have a question, something that we were talking about earlier. So if you look at this nest right here, in front of us. If you look towards the foot of it, John, it looks like there's an egg that's outside of the nest. Yes. Will they put that egg back in the nest? No. Once once an egg has in in a lot of a lot of different things cause an egg to come out of the nest. The uh, the pelican sitting on the nest with three eggs in it and jumps up to to fly away and the and knocks the egg out. Another bird will come up come by the nest and maybe knock the egg out. Once the egg is out of the nest, that's it. The adult never touches the egg again. Nor does the adult break open the egg when the chick is in the inside the egg. The chick has to break out on its own. The only thing the adult will do is once the chick hatch, the adult will take the pieces of the egg and throw them outside the nest. So Kind of a side note that's interesting here, we see some trash in this area, and this is a non-populated island, but this is part of the marine debris issue as well. Ab absolutely. Ab what you're seeing is storm storm surge. Uh, you can just pan through here and you'll see all, all kinds of uh, debris that's been cast up on this island from, from various storm surges. Um, 
and and that is a that is a major major issue is is a debris like that does it disturb even though we saw the tire with the bird's nest in it does it disturb any of their have you noticed that in the years you've yeah. studied yeah no it it does not it does not the debris does not interfere with their nesting uh their net any of their nest building of their nest or anything um and you can see that they they build a pretty good nest i mean the basic part of the nest is normally uh broken off dead sticks and then they pile in uh some softer grasses around the to, to cushion the eggs so the the debris is i mean it's unsightly uh we don't need it we need to get our handle on it but it does not interfere uh right now another with, uh, uh issue with marine debris is the microplastics and um yep. there's you know there's still a lot of questions a lot of unanswered questions about how those microplastics um may enter the food chain Absolutely. and how they may affect like they may interfere with um, they, different hormones. Sure, absolutely, a absolutely. There's there's lots of lots of unanswered questions uh, pertaining to that, especially as those microplastics move through the food chain. You know, mm -hmm. from from floating in the water column into fish, into fish tissue, and then from fish tissue into into adults, and then and then what happens? And and that's that's uh, that's where science will have to take us. So um, I think a lot of people don't realize uh, the origins of plastic. Now we are uh, developing, we meaning people, are developing different kinds of plastics, but um, most of our plastics are primarily, they primar primarily come from petroleum. So, um, you know. But, right. Well, that's what I was going to say, that there are questions about whether they may be uh, hormone disruptors right. in the food and, chain. Right. And, and I mean, that, that's something that, you know, we'll have to, in the future, we'll have to look more and more at how that, how that affects um, all kinds of things in the food chain. I mean, uh, from, from microscopic all the, way, all the way up to these guys right here. So and we got to get a handle on that. that. That's the biggest issue is... is are you able to tell the age of these birds that are sitting on the nest? No. Based on their... No. They're like, you can see this one. Now look, look, that one there, you just saw that one move the egg onto her right foot. And that's one of the things she's doing. She's moving the egg up to her foot and then she'll slide that foot further under the egg as the temperature regulator. Now and the males and, they, and the females share the responsibilities they, yes, of Yes, they, they share the responsibility of, of hatching these eggs. One will be out feeding and the other one will be sitting on the eggs and then they'll swap roles and go out and the other one will go out and feed. That's a, that's a pretty good shot you got there, Angela. Another thing that you've looked at with um, the, you know, maybe human impacts is um, mercury on the pelicans right we did we had a graduate student uh, that worked uh, did a great great research project on tracking mercury from sediment to bivalves from bivalves to bottom bottom feeding fish midwater fish all the way to the pelicans and what was interesting is what she found um, is that as the mercury levels were increased we, what we did is we sampled the eggs. We would, we would actually sacrifice and sample some eggs from the first egg to the third egg. And what she found in her studies is that the first egg laid, if there was going to be any toxicity from, from mercury, the first egg had the dominant mercury content. The second two eggs had very little mercury in it. So the bird within its body system sequestered that, that mercury into that first egg. How? That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting physiological reaction. We don't, we don't know, but that was a great study. And so, so instead of that um, uh, being sort of affect, affecting the entire clutch, it would affect one third one, of the one, clutch? One bird. And, and what we don't know and we still don't know, although there's all, all this anecdotal stuff about humans and mercury and all that, we don't know what the fate of that mercury within, within the chick 
is. How, how does it really affect the, uh, the chick? Does it shorten its lifespan? Does it interfere with anything else? Does it interfere with reproduction down the road? We, we, don't, we don't know that. And um, so that's a that's a way of like eliminating mercury from the from the adult anyway, and then protecting two thirds of the clutch. Um, do they do they shed it through their feathers as well? Um, Lauren did some of the, she did some feather work on it. Uh, found a little bit through the feathers, but nowhere near the concentration that was in the in the first egg laid. So John work close to where you can kind of make out the beak here. The very, very tip of it that we're looking at, where it's pointed down, is that what helps them crack the egg when they're young and they're no. a baby? No, no. What, <clears throat> okay, the adults have that, that curved bill so they can grab on and hold on to things, but when they're, when they're babies, the babies built well inside their egg, the babies actually have, you can just barely see a little white dot. On the top of their bill, there's this little crown of calcium, and that's called an egg tooth. And so the chick inside that egg, as it's ready to hatch, will move its head up and down, up and down, and that egg tooth will crack open the shell. Now, the chick has to crack open the entire shell and break out because the adult will not assist in that. So it's through that little egg tooth that, that the chick is able to hatch out. Do they shed that egg tooth? Yes, the egg tooth, the egg tooth disappears shortly after they hatch. So what is, talking about the egg, what is the thickness of the shell? Since you <laughs> said that you have worked on some of, of that, what is the... Well, I mean, the... I don't. I, I can't tell you. I, I can't tell you the millimeter thickness of of uh, of the these it's eggs. Like chicken egg. But yeah, I mean, they're they're a lot. The thickness is a lot like a, a chicken egg, or or a turkey egg, or a goose egg. Um, the the part that you were talking about was the thinning of you know when, during the when we had the problems with the DDT. What are and, these guys doing? Well, tr try, one's pr probably trying to find where its nest is, and the other one's sitting there crowding it. They seem yeah. to put their nests very close together. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, Mike asked a good question earlier. He said, uh, how close do they nest? Well, at first, they are one stretched neck away. So an adult will try to keep everybody away from them within one stretched neck. But there are so many nesting together, pretty soon that becomes not attainable. And so their nests become right on top of one another. And it doesn't, in the end, it doesn't seem to bother them. And then they even go, we've seen many on the ground, but I just spotted one up here that's actually... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, again, their preferred nesting would not be on the ground. It would normally be up in the vegetation. But because we don't have predators, there's really no predators here that, that are going to attack these eggs on, on the ground. So they're... They're good. So you mentioned, oh look, look, look up, look up. White ibis, a flock of white ibis. I think I missed them. So you mentioned, there's some more. So you mentioned some of the other birds that um, nest on this island, but they're not nesting yet, is that right? Now, as a matter of fact, this is the first flock of white ibis. We've been, we've been out here for the last uh, three months, and that's the very first flock of white ibis that we've seen out here. So they will, they will start to establish the nesting site uh, in the vegetation. Now those birds definitely nest up in the vegetation. They like the shrubbery, uh, so they'll nest up in the vegetation and they'll start establishing their nest within the next two weeks. And gulls? Laughing gulls uh, are the dominant bird, dominant gull that nests out here. Um, and they nest, they build grass nests, but they like to tuck them up underneath the vegetation. And um, one of the things we try to do when we do in our studies is not disturb the site for very long because laughing gulls um, they seem to be hungry all the time so they'll come and if you get an adult off a nest the laughing gull will come and eat the egg so um, 
we're, you know, we're cautious about, about that. And, that's, and again, the success of this island and this colony is because it's, it's, it's remote. And the public's not supposed to be here. It's hard for them to get, you know, you're not supposed to be on the island. It's a restricted island. And the birds have success because they're not disturbed. Disturbance, you could, you could lose the colony. You could lose a large portion of the colony uh, through human disturbance. For your research, how often do you come out? Uh, right now, this time of year, we come out twice a month. And by, by the end, by the first part of May, second part of May, we'll be out here three times a month. And what is the reason for you to come out here? One, we do nest counts, we do egg counts, uh, population count. We wanna, we'll come and count. We'll walk the colony with clickers and count all the nests that we can find. So, it, so again, we establish this long-term database on how many birds are here and, and if there are major changes. How, many, how, long is your, how old is your database? How far back does your database go? Uh, about 20 years, about, about 20 years right now. And how long have you, did you say it is held steady at about 5,000? Yeah, about years? for the last six years, about the last six, seven years, about, about the same. Uh, and, you know, we're in just one location. When they, start, when they start nesting more and more, they'll be all over the island. There'll be, there'll be a colony on the northeast corner that you have to get to. Then there'll be a colony on the interior part. Um, so. so we have another question from Greg. Um, do the brown pelicans produce the large growths on their beak like a white pelican? Do they produce a large growth on their beak? No, the white pelicans, um, white pelicans are visitors to uh, our area, to the northern Gulf of Mexico. They arrive in October and they stay all winter long with, with us. And then this time of year, right now, they bunch up and they're getting ready to make their migratory flight path back to Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Great Salt Lake, where that's where they breed. But in the process, as they're, as they're developing here and the hormones start to flow, when you, when you see a white pelican now, you'll see a breeding notch starting to form on the upper bill. And it's truly a big notch. And it's a breeding notch that helps them when they get to their nesting sites in, in, in the north, um, find males and females. Hey, baby, look at this notch over here. So that's how they that's how they pair up. Uh, looking at that at that breeding. Once they breed and start their nest, the notch falls off until the next cycle. Now every single year, there's always a, a cadre of white pelicans that did not have enough hormones, and so all their buddies leave, and these guys are left by themselves to fend for themselves here. They feed totally different than brown pelicans. Mm -hmm. They, uh, brown pelicans spot their prey from the air and dive on it. White pelicans swim in a group and they circle their prey from the surface of the water and dip their bills in to get their prey. They're also so a lot bigger than brown pelicans. And, and they're again half the size of a brown pelican. And no, speaking that of they're the twice the size of a brown pelican. Almost. Speaking of the different species of pelicans, we've spot you've spotted one another species here, correct? We we did about three years ago. We spotted a, a brown pelican that had a red pouch, and I'm sitting here describing it to you all and telling you the story that the brown pelican from California is the one that has the red pouch. And as we did our research, we found that some of those birds had migrated to Texas and then some over to Louisiana and just as we were talking about it here comes one that flies right by us and they are here there, there were three when we first found them about three or four years ago and really their their pouch has a distinctive red uh, area to it uh, they do apparently from everything we've read they do crossbreed uh, with with our brown pelicans here and what percent have red pouches and what do not, I don't, I don't know. There's one over there doing the uh, guler flutter. So that, that, that little fluttering that you see in, in the bird's pouch is a, a method of cooling, just like a dog panting. Um, they, they, later in the year when it gets really hot, 
their mouth will be open, their whole their whole pouch will be exposed, and it will be fluttering. And and uh, because it's va highly vascularized, lots of blood vessels, and that's how they can off set off the heat. So when they dive and they catch their the fish. Um, how 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 much volume can they hold in their bill? Yeah, you know, what's it? What's the little lid? How much? <laughs> the, the pelican the, whose bill can hold more than his belly can. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the volume is. The minute the minute they hit the water, as they start to come up, they're they're spewing water out out their bill. Many a time. Um, you'll see gulls hanging around where the brown pelican's diving. And uh, the gull will get right up to the mouth of that brown pelican. Sometimes the brown pelican will even reach out and grab that gull and have that gull for a few seconds by the head as the, as the gull's trying to steal its prey. Uh, we have a question from Jazzy. What's the normal food chain for pelicans? Which animals would normally prey on them? On brown pelicans? Uh, really, nobody preys on an adult brown pelican. The major predator would be a predator on the eggs or on the chicks. Um, raccoons would, on a lot of colonies, raccoons would be a major predator on uh, eggs and chicks. But again, because of our isolation here, thank goodness right now we have no raccoons. Uh, fire ants, fire ants will... We have, we have seen fire ants that will take uh, a chick um, away. And we did find a black racer uh, when, when we were first entering the island, we found a black racer snake. And uh, they, they, can take a, they can take a chick. You hear the laughing gulls laughing. And the laughing gulls in the background. Well, we don't want to disturb them too much longer as we've been here. That's right. Yep. So, so I mean, we will. We can note too that uh, <laughs> that um, it's it, you know it's not very hot out here right now. Right. We right. We have some uh, uh, Logan. Do you want to pass those over here? We have some pelican bones. If you want to show the. Sure. So these are we just found them around the. Yeah. Place. This is just the hip. This is the back part of the backbone, part of the hip. You can see the juncture for the for the legs. What's interesting about these birds is um, their their bone their bone structure uh, is is extremely extremely strong. The uh, the bones are hollow. They don't the bones don't weigh anything that gives a bird flight. But their strength is phenomenal. Um, it, it's hard to even break. It's hard to even break. A brown pelican bone because of the strength. The inside of the bone, inside this hollow bone, are little fibers that connect all the way around the bone. And those fibers are what give the strength. And if you were to cut open a wing of an airplane, one of a, big, a big airplane, inside that wing, you'll find all these little connectors that support the, the top and the bottom of the wing. Wings are fuel tanks. That's where the fuel's carried, and so the structure of that wing is a is just just like a bird wing. It's it's it gives it strength in those little those little structures that hold it together. So, um, is there anything that you would kind of say is like a main message to um, well, leave with? Yeah, I mean, to me, the you know, to me, this habitat, Mobile Bay, uh, the Mobile Tensaw Delta. The nearshore waters of the Gulf are highly, highly productive and highly di diverse habitat. And uh, to me, it, it's really a privilege to be able to live and to work in, in this habitat. And for us to pass this on, uh, pass this on to our children and our grandchildren, we have to be cognizant of what we do to these waters. You pointed out the marine debris. We have to be cognizant of what we're putting into the water. We have to stay on top of that and, and make sure that we have a healthy ecosystem, not just for us right now that we're sharing with everybody, but for the future generations that want to have the same experience that we're having. I always like to point out the recovery of these birds is uh, an amazing environmental success story that is thanks uh, to the efforts of, of people. So. 
you know, we uh, created an environmental problem with the DDT, and then we recognized that problem and addressed it. And addressed and, it. Uh, yep. And these birds have made a remarkable yep. recovery in the, in the decades since. Yep. So we have talked about the brown pelicans, but the ospreys and the uh, bald eagles Bald eagles, also right. So, so there are, you know, we can make a difference. All of, all of us can make a difference. And that's, what, and that's what's important. And that's, these birds have been taken off of the endangered species list. That's correct. They're off the endangered species list because their population's uh, sustained, uh, which is which is wonderful. That's mm -hmm. a great that's a great tribute to efforts put forth by everybody. Yeah. So you know we have identified some issues that that we need to address. Um, but you know I always like to point out that uh, you know it's not a hopeless case. We we can do it. Absolutely. So thanks for joining us this morning, and we hope that you will tune in next time. Thank you all. Thank you, John. Thank you.